All right, guys, let's keep talking about the Industrial Revolution. Today, we're going to focus specifically on the use of water power in the Industrial Revolution. And so you saw in this previous video, wasn't that really cool? Uh, the, the, how a, a, sp a water mill would work where they would grind the, you saw them taking in the different kinds of seeds and grains and grinding it into flour. So uh, that's one way that water power was used in water mills. Um, we talked about yesterday, the one that you could go visit in Dollywood and see it working on the inside. That would be a lot of fun to do later on. <clears throat> and also, uh, we talked yesterday about how they would use water to turn machines that would spin the cotton into yarn. And so that'll be in this reading today. So we're going to read this text today together called Water Power. I'm also going to put this text in your questions today. So you do not have to go back to these slides to find the answers. It'll be at the top of your questions today. So, um, but I want you to listen to the lesson so we can talk about it together and read through this together about water power. Now let's get started. It would be wrong to talk about early American history without mentioning the machines that helped make the economy work. In an era before the steam engine and electricity, many of these machines were powered by moving water, like water mills. When you think about early American towns, you might picture homes, churches, a meeting house, and a store. Don't forget about the mill. In the early 1700s, the United States had thousands of them, and they were the heart of the economy. Water-powered mills were built along fast-moving rivers and creeks. A mill used water to turn the large wheel that was connected to gears. Those gears could be used to do many things, like you saw in the video. In early America, the main purpose of the mill was to grind corn and wheat into flour. This kind of mill was called a grist mill. Farmers took their harvest to a man who owned the mill, known as the miller. The miller ground up the wheat and corn into flour and typically kept a portion of the flour as a payment. That worked well, didn't it? Here's a picture of a woman spinning cotton at a reenactment in Sumner County, Tennessee. She's using the spinning jenny to spin some cotton. Men who built mills were known as millwrights. Millwrights were skilled craftsmen who could repair all the gears that made the mill work. Entire communities depended on millwrights to keep their economies going. The big problem with water mills was their dependency on a normal amount of rain. If the river flooded, the mill might get taken away by floodwaters. During the dry season, there might not be enough water to power the mill, and it might have to shut down. Water-powered mills would eventually be made obsolete. And obsolete means they don't, they don't matter. They're not worth anything anymore. When did that happen? Well, when the steam engine was developed. Today, there are a few mills left in Tennessee, left standing, five in Tennessee. However, creeks and rivers uh, were often named for the fact that there was a mill there. That's why there are 11 mill creeks in New York and 17 in Pennsylvania. The cotton gin. Right now, you're wearing clothes made of cotton. However, the process of making cotton into clothes is not simple. When cotton is harvested, it comes off in little white balls that have black seeds buried in them. We looked at that yesterday, too, with my little cotton ball reef here. To do anything with cotton, you must remove the seeds from the cotton balls. Then the little white threads of the cotton have to be spun into yarn. The yarn then has to be woven into cloth. In the 1700s, the process of removing the seeds and spinning cotton into thread was slow. Farm families would sit around for hours removing cotton seeds. The job of spinning cotton into thread was done by a person working at a spinning wheel, one thread of yarn at a time. Because this took a long time, cotton clothing cost a lot of money. Only the rich could afford cotton clothes, and so there wasn't much demand for cotton. Several important inventions changed that. One was the loom, a foot-powered machine that could weave several threads of cotton yarn into cloth at the same time. Another was a cotton gin, gin is short for engine, invented by Eli Whitney. We learned about this yesterday. The cotton gin removed the cotton seeds from the cotton balls with speed. After machines such as the loom and cotton gin were invented, it became much cheaper to make clothes out of cotton. The growth and manufacture of cotton became much more common. In warm climates where cotton grew best, people developed large cotton farms called plantations. These plantations needed a lot of people to work there, and many of these people were slaves. So, starting around 1800, people who lived in places where cotton grew well started buying huge numbers of slaves, buying them. That's called the slave trade. They would buy people. 
and moving them to places such as North Carolina, Tennessee, and Louisiana. And then we talked yesterday also about factories. It used to be that raw materials were converted to finished products on a small scale. A grist mill converted corn and wheat into flour. A lumber mill took chopped down trees and cut them into lumber. Kids sat around the fire at night removing cotton seeds from cotton. Their mothers spun cotton into thread using a cotton spinner. But during the Industrial Revolution, many of these functions were moved to central locations called factories, where many people worked on the same process at once. Factories were first developed in Great Britain in about 1770. The British government did not allow the factory system and the technology that made it work to be brought to the American colonies because it wanted the colonies to remain dependent on Britain. However, in 1730, 1793, Samuel Slater designed the first cotton factory in the United States at Paul Tuckett, Rhode Island. Slater did so copying technology that he had seen in Britain, the most important innovation being a special kind of loom called a spinning jenny. That's why the British people called him Slater the Trader. <laughs> at first, Slater's factory spun cotton. Here we see a man using a loom uh, like that would have been used in the 1700s. At first, Slater's factory spun cotton into thread using 72 spindles, which were all powered by children pushing foot pedals. You would, you'd had to work in a factory back then, maybe, if you lived there. He eventually transformed the factory to run on water power, sort of a very large water mill. Slater's factory grew, and he built more factories. Eventually, hundreds of thousands of people moved to be near factories such as the ones developed by Slater. Today, Slater is known as the father of the American factory system. Do you remember from our, yes, or, uh, our lesson yesterday what that word was when people started moving to the cities to work in factories? It was urbanization is the big word we saw yesterday. The cotton gin, the spinning jenny, and the new factory system helped turn the cotton into America's number one cash crop. In 1790, the United States produced about 2 million pounds of cotton. That number rose to 60 million pounds in 1805 and 350 million pounds in 1830. That's a lot of cotton, isn't it, produced? It's a lot of money being made off the hard work of slaves who didn't get paid anything. Here was a, the Slater Mill, the first one he built in Paul Tucket, Rhode Island. And this is where they made all the cotton and the yarn and textiles. This cotton spinning machine inside the Slater Mill was run by water power. So you see, fancy machine. All right, well, you've got some questions to go with this text today. And these pictures of uh, this text will be at the top of your questions. So there's no need to come back to these slides. I'll put them in there, make it easy for you to find the answers. All right, go get busy on that. Learn more about water mills. We'll see you tomorrow.